Welcome to The Roz Project, a conversation about life, entrepreneurship, personal development, family, tech, and marketing. My name is Ivan Temelkoff, and I'm your host. What's in this podcast for you? Here you will grasp life-changing advice to help you level up every aspect of your life in business and to help you reach your goals and dreams. And as always, all content is 100% real, raw, and unfiltered. On today's show, I'm pretty excited to have a fellow digital marketer, and uh, her name is Alexis Schomer, hopefully I pronounced that correctly, who's a serial entrepreneur with a passion for solving problems through innovation, born and raised in Los Angeles. She graduated from California Lutheran University, Thousand Oaks, where she co-founded her first tech startup. Alexis has been recognized for her passion and hard work as a business owner, by the city of Santa Barbara, the Camarillo City Council, and the California State Legislature, and the U.S. Congress, and was awarded the Emerging Business Award by the Spirit of Entrepreneurship Foundation. She is a frequent speaker at educational and motivational events, publishes articles across various disciplines, and is a consultant for marketing and business practices in addition to running her company Simply Branded. So Alexis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here. I'm super excited. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, typically when I read out these bios, most people are like, okay, Ivan, get to the punch, get to the punch. But, you know, I always, always, you know, take pleasure in, in reading, you know, about the background of people and how they got to where they are today. So with that being said, let's spend the next couple of minutes, you know, tell us uh, and, and mind you, one of the things that you you shared is that you're a self-taught entrepreneur. Let's talk about, you know, how did this all started? You know, let's take us way back to like the beginning of time of, you know, Alexis's entrepreneurial journey. Yeah, absolutely. So my entrepreneurial journey began, I would say, the senior year of my um, college education when I decided to take Entrepreneurship 101. I joined the Entrepreneurship Club and I started learning about what it's like to be an entrepreneur. Um, Before that, I always wanted to be a business owner, but I didn't understand the difference between a business owner and an entrepreneur until I learned like how to think like an entrepreneur. And what that means is um, instead of just seeing problems and, um, you know, getting frustrated, I started to think of solutions to those problems and think innovatively of how to solve them. And that was really like the pivotal moment for me to become an entrepreneur. So during my senior year, I took the class. I participated in a competition called Startup Weekend, which is a 54-hour competition where you pitch business ideas, form teams, and then by the end of the um, period, you pitch your business. So I actually won that competition and won $10,000 for my idea along with my team. And that was really my entry point into startups, um, starting my own business, and I've never looked back since. So. Since that, since that day, I've just been working on building um, different companies, um, actually exited my first startup a few years ago, and currently running uh, my second startup, as well as my digital marketing agency. Very cool. Very cool. You know, the reason I always ask about the story is, is because I'm always curious as to what drives people, you know, what motivates them, what is... What is their why and purpose? Was was there ever, you know, a why or a purpose that, you know, kind of like maybe you had this epiphany that, hey, this is what I want to do. Was it like you just took interest towards, you know, the entrepreneurial path? I mean, I don't I, I don't think I'm tied to a specific why in terms of um, one solution. But I think my why is just using my brain to solve problems and think creatively. And after I sold my first um, my first startup. I was just ready for the next one. So my why is more of like being innovative and continuing the process of problem solving and sharing, sharing that thought process with others to encourage them to think creatively, think innovatively. So I would say the why is more of like a pull in in the industry rather than a specific um, like solution or business. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, cool. You know, one of the things that you had mentioned in your bio is that you're a self-taught entrepreneur and you know, I think that there's sort of this misconception when it comes to entrepreneurship, because I think a lot of people think that, you know, you got to have a certain level of education, or you got to be, you know, intelligent enough, or, you know, you got to have a certain amount of money. Let's talk about that. What, what, what was the self-taught entrepreneur in your eyes? Like, how, how did you approach that? So coming from a place with little to no money for funding for a business, it forced me to be very resourceful. And 
good entrepreneurs know how to fill in the gaps. So you don't have to be an expert at everything, but you fill in those gaps by bringing in those people that have the expertise that you need. And by self-taught, I mean, um, I didn't, I mean, I went to school for, for business and I learned about, you know, marketing, advertising and things like that. But really you don't learn in school what you need to learn in the real world. So launching my first tech company, um, I think I was 21 when we first launched it and we had to figure out everything on our own. So we were learning how to market effectively and affordably. Um, we were learning how to create pitch decks, pitch investors. We had to learn about industries that we had no experience in, such as workers' compensation, insurance, things like that. And the real entrepreneur just kind of jumps in and it's, it's really a lot of research in the beginning to make yourself an expert in the industry if you don't come from that background. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's how I'd say we were self-taught. My team and I, it was our first time doing something like this and we all jumped in and, and researched uh, as much as we could, um, went to events to learn from people who have done it before, um, sought, out, sought mentors who could teach us things. And we were just in like the educational phase of learning and learning and learning so that we could do things the right way. And there's definitely a lot of trial and error. There's a lot of failure mm -hmm. and learning from those mistakes. But um, essentially every entrepreneur is gonna go through that journey. And if you're not, I would say all entrepreneurs have to be self-taught at some point because you're gonna, you're gonna need to learn new things along the way. And unless you have tons of money and you wanna pay for a course or you wanna go to school for a topic, um, you're gonna teach yourself online. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's the saying, and I'm probably going to butcher who, who is it by, but uh, I think it goes along the lines of, you know, former education will help you create a career and then self-education will help you build an empire. And mm -hmm. I absolutely agree 100% with what you said, being a, a fellow self-taught self entrepreneur is just that if you are resourceful, if you are creative, if you're willing, you know, like you said, you know, you learn through trial and error. You know, yeah. uh, trial and error, in fact, is experience and the discoverability also, you know, that's how, like you said, you position yourself as an expert after you try and fail multiple times, eventually you're going to get it right. I think it's the resilience factor in a lot of entrepreneurs that's missing whatever it is that, that you're doing, you know, building any kind of business in any industry or any vertical, you know, you got to have that resilience factor and know that you're going to fail. You're probably going to fail more times than you're going to succeed. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like, you know, for every 10 failures that you have, be excited about the one epic win that you have because it's going to be victorious. Um, so it's just interesting you mentioned that because I feel like that's sort of a constant with uh, a lot of people that, you know, come on the, on the show as well as this, you know, there, a lot of them are entrepreneurs, self-taught, and it's all about failure, trial and error and trial, error and experience. You know, one thing that you mentioned is that, you know, you love getting outdoors and traveling and, you know, you love doing fun stuff. You know, let's talk a little bit about how does that play into entrepreneurship? You know, do you, do you see an importance into like leisure and doing things that you love and how does that play or in your experience, how does that play it out for you? Yeah, I think balance as much as you can, even though the perfect balance never exists, but trying to balance your, your mind and having the, the leisure activities that you enjoy, your hobbies, getting outdoors. I think it's all hundred percent important to running a successful business because if your mind's not in the right place, you're not going to be as focused. You're not going to be as efficient with your time. You're not going to um, be able to work as hard as you would if you had a clear mind. So uh, I think all those types of activities are a good way to keep your mind healthy. And um, it all starts up here. It's, if you're stressed out and you're working long days and you don't take any breaks and you're not working on your mental health, you're not going to be an effective or an efficient entrepreneur. Yeah, no, that's, that's the reason I asked this because it's sort of like, like I said, again, it's another, it's another constant with a lot of entrepreneurs is that, you know, if you're, if your mind is in the right place, like you said, you're going to be focused, you know, you're going to be channeling your energy in the right place and you're going to have better production. In fact, in everything that you do, it's just amazing how it rewires, you know, your mind. Um, so one thing that I wanted to talk with you about is so, you know, the last, what, three or four months have been some of the most challenging times that we've seen in the country, right? COVID and political things and the economy and all of that. You know, you know, one thing I want to talk with you about is so for brands, for individuals, you know, we're really trying to create more exposure out there in the marketplace, you know, whether it's with social media or their presence or just all of that. Like what recommendations, you know, do you have for businesses that basically are trying to survive? 
So yeah, these times have definitely been challenging and it's forced a lot of us to kind of pivot our business. Some people have had to kind of create new services and just adapt. And I would say that because some people may have more time on their hands, um, I would say focus on content and focus on things that you can still produce to gain exposure, reach new people, um, kind of hype up your brand with little to no money. So if you are quarantined at home, you have more time than you might have before. You know, you're not commuting to work. You're taking out the, the time commuting traffic, things like that. So use this time to create a content calendar of topics that would be interested that your audience would be interested in and create content by content. I mean, blogs, social media posts, videos, um, go on, get on, get on some podcasts, get that exposure. And what, what the key is to creating content is repurposing it. So if you write one blog, let's, let's say 500 words, you can probably create five to 10 social media posts out of that blog, share them on Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest, um, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, you know, you can create little snippets of 30 second clips of pieces of that blog to share and just repurpose the content on all these different platforms, drive people to sign up for your email list by giving away an ebook or a PDF with, with a, a list of 10 tips for X, Y, Z, depending on your business. Um, and also right now, social media is a huge outlet for reaching new people since mm -hmm. people are quarantined at home the social media usage has like skyrocketed. So it's the perfect time to be posting your content on Instagram, connecting with new people and building your community um, while you have this like engaged audience on all these social platforms. Absolutely. I mean, there were so many key elements that you shared in that entire statement that I think a lot of people don't realize. And the first thing I want to do actually elaborate upon is you were talking about, you know, the, the, the key to creating content is repurposing content. Actually, I stumbled across this recently because over the last 12 years from YouTube alone, I have close to 200 videos and I'm one of those people that like, I'm, I create a lot of social video to create awareness and interest. Like you said, you know, create that exposure out there for yourself because after all, you know, success is not going to come served on a silver platter, nor people are going to want to sign up or pay you for a service, you know, unless you create that exposure and create that attraction. So I realized you know, it'd be cool if I took all these videos that I thought I was rambling in and just chop them up into small pieces. And suddenly I found out, you know what? I don't have to whirl my brain every single day and come up with fresh content when that content's been there. You just resurface it and then you drive people back to it by creating more exposure to that old content. So suddenly you're taking them from the bottom of the barrel and bringing it up to the top of the top of the barrel. You know, so it gives it more, more visibility. So yes, you, like you were t saying, social media is a great outlet for people right now. I think the struggle is a lot of people are failing to communicate properly on social media. Um, maybe because, you know, a lot of, let's face it, there's a lot of crap on social media right now from politics and, you know, should you wear a mask or should you not wear a mask? And I'm just like, ah, like just filter out my news. So it's like, how about, okay, if, you choose to wear them, I'm asked, great. If you choose not to, let's talk about something more productive. You know, that's kind of my take on it right now. So um, in terms of social media specifically, and I know one of the things that, you know, I want to chat with you about is Facebook advertising. What are your thoughts on the current state of Facebook ads, paid social, should companies, you know, explore? What are the pros and cons of it? Um, so Facebook ads have been changing rapidly. They constantly have new rules. They have new guidelines. Um, they block a lot of content. And right now there's like a boycott going on. So some, some huge companies are boycotting Facebook advertising. Mm -hmm. um, and you can look this up to get the list of them. But there were some large companies in there that are just uh, completely avoiding the platform altogether because of um, kind of the politics behind Facebook and all the, yeah. the rules and regulations and stuff. So if you do, so Facebook advertising is critical for some businesses, for example, e-commerce, they probably spend anywhere between 15,000 to a hundred thousand dollars a month on Facebook ads to get that current, the consistent uh, customer stream. Um, so it is, it is critical for some businesses, but it's also costly. If you're, if you, if you're hiring an agency to run your Facebook advertising, it's yeah. going to cost you thousands of dollars. And if you're not paying thousands of dollars, they're probably not doing it right. So in order to get the results, you need to invest the money and it's an expensive investment. Um, I would advise companies to start off organically because you have complete control over what you're posting. 
Um, organic reach is better because it's, it's essentially free. You're not paying for it, but you do have to um, consistently post, send the right message, contact the right people. And there are ways to go about it that can be um, more affordable. For example, you can hire a social media intern, but then you would have to teach them, make sure they're doing the right thing, give them guidelines, or you can hire a, like a boutique agency that might have more affordable rates and an agency would handle a lot of the elements for you. And a good agency will also teach you along the way as an entrepreneur. So maybe you hire an agency for three months, um, learn the ins and outs, and then maybe you downgrade the package so that you can manage some of the social, they can manage some of the social so that you're growing the account at the rate you want for the price you want. Yeah, no, that's a, an excellent point. And you were talking about the politics of Facebook and you know, I was thinking of, some of the things I was reading is like Procter and Gamble was planning on pulling all their Facebook ads by the end of the year. And uh, I think Honda was another one, which, you know, these are major brands that are spending historically a lot of money on Facebook ads for attraction. And it kind of makes me wonder, I, I think it's, there's pros and cons to that. It's just that, yes, you know, the association is definitely not a pro because there's just so much backlash that Facebook is getting. But I think the, the, the advantage to that maybe is, is that, you know, ads are cheaper. The cost per click might be cheaper because so many brands are basically turning off budgets and Facebook is suddenly desperate for advertisers, um, which probably we're going to see a lot more of, I think, in the coming months is, you know, with stuff that Facebook pushes out is, is try to attract more advertisers, more businesses to come onto the platform to basically make up, supplement for, you know, the advertisers that left. Yeah. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Is it, is it a matter of, of, of ethics, I guess, business ethics, or, you know, how would you go about something like that and making a decision whether or not Facebook ads is a good route right now? Um, well, like I said, it does come down to the client's budget and um, where their audience is. So it depends on who the target audience is. Are they on Facebook? Are they on Instagram? Are they on TikTok? Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of um, increase in, in social media usage. But I think, like you said, with all, of, with all the politics going on on Facebook and all the, um, you know, the masks and the videos, people are shying away from that. And I'm, I've, I'm seeing a trend towards other platforms um, yeah. Facebook will, is, is huge and you know, there's the groups, the communities, the pages that people are sharing content and sharing information and connecting in. But, um, I would just do an analysis on the target audience. And if they are on Facebook, then Facebook ads would definitely still be a viable option if they had the budget to create the content, hire the agency to run the ads and all that kind of stuff. Um, if not, you know, we're seeing a spike in TikTok usage and there's uh, all the politics behind that as well. And you know, the U S <laughs> right. banning it. So, uh, but the, but the influencers on TikTok are, are being contracted like thousands, thousands of dollars per, per sponsored post. And yeah. they're trying and Instagram or Facebook slash Instagram is trying to pull them out. So, uh, Facebook's actually paying influencers on TikTok to come to Instagram instead <laughs> to capture really? that. Yeah. That is insane. Well, you know what? Uh, of course, you know, the target demographic is different on TikTok. It's much younger, right? And um, what's really interesting when you were talking about that, because I've been like a hit and miss on TikTok personally. I mean, I, I like the platform, but like I also got a million other things to do. So the consistency factor definitely isn't there. But I also noticed that TikTok was the number one downloaded app in the app store. And he has been for like, so it's not Facebook. It's not Instagram which Instagram is owned by Facebook. It's not Snapchat for sure, which who knows where it lands now, but it's TikTok, right? And everything that I've been reading is like, I think India banned TikTok. And now I think in on Hong Kong, I think that we're using it for like um, investigative reasons. And I'm just thinking, I'm like, why are we trying? Because I, I see TikTok as an expression platform. In fact, it's boosting creativity. And so many people are worrying about, well, is the Chinese government spying on me because I'm sharing a TikTok? Well, guess what? If you pass the app store, because I remember seeing a Facebook conversation that I laughed at so hard. Someone responded and said, well, TikTok is spyware. You should remove it. I'm like, are you trying to tell me that the app store and, and, and the Google uh, store is ran by clowns that they didn't actually pay their due diligence to see if this app actually runs on spyware and though they're distributed to the masses? I mean, of course, there's always that chance, but they wouldn't take that chance to sacrifice their reputation. So the, the first thing that I think about is, and, and I actually meant to ask you, 
what have you been hearing about uh, TikTok advertising? So I know that, you know, they have a paid model, which I don't know, it might be out now. Uh, I know a lot of companies are getting excited about it. A lot of entrepreneurs are getting excited about it. What's your thoughts on that? Oh, uh, I've seen, yeah, I've seen TikTok start to do paid advertising. Um, I've seen a lot of Panera Bread advertisements on there. Um, oh, okay. But I think the companies that are strategically advertising on TikTok are leveraging the influencers as opposed to paid ads. Mm -hmm. And they're paying, they can pay up to $40,000 per post for one post for a TikToker. Wow. Because, because the like number one TikToker can reach like over 60 million people. So they have such an engaged audience that these brands are willing to pay that much money for a single post because it's so yeah. powerful because they have so much of a reach. Um, but in order for companies to be successful on TikTok, they do have to get creative and their ads have to look like organic content or else people are gonna swipe right through them. Um, and right. TikTok does let you swipe through the ads. So it's, it's not like YouTube where you have to, you're forced to watch it for X amount of seconds. You're able to just skip right through it if it looks like an ad. So companies do have to get creative and they have to leverage the influencers on TikTok so that people watch the material. You know, that's crazy is I think a lot of people were lured into TikTok for two main reasons. One is creativity and two is the organic reach. It's insane. Like there's some people that, uh, that I know that will get like 400,000 views on a TikTok, you know, and yeah. I know like, you know, a lot of celebrities have flocked into it. I know like The Rock and Kevin Hart, you know, is on it. And of course, yeah, most people are like, yeah, well, they're a celebrity. I'm like, no, not really. Just because they're a celebrity, they're just creative because the content that they share is very creative. It's, it's, it's got humor in it, right? It's informational. And that's in essence what TikTok is. And then what's really interesting that you mentioned, which really kind of goes back to, I think, logistics and also ethics is that TikTok allows you to skip an ad. No, there's no other platform out there that really allows you a social platform that has a paid model that allows you to skip an ad because that's where they get you basically. So I think TikTok has figured out that, you know what, if we allow the user to fast forward through an ad, it's actually going to attribute to a retention. They're going to stick around longer because guess what? When people see a paid ad on a social platform, what do they do? They run. They try to try to figure out how to escape it, especially if it's an ad that they have zero interest in. Right. Because let's face it, that's really hard nowadays to serve up a very targeted ad to an end user that they're genuinely interested in. Um, so I'm really curious personally to see where TikTok goes with this paid model, because I would think that, you know, a lot of brands are going to try to leverage it, you know, as quickly as possible before it gets so saturated. Because as we know, most paid platforms get saturated, like, you know, Google ads or Instagram ads or uh, Twitter ads, even, you know, if anybody even still does those. Um, well, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Alexis. You know, there's been so much that you shared. I love that, you know, you talked about the self-taught entrepreneurship. There's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are self-taught entrepreneurs. And it's always interesting to hear someone else's story on, you know, uh, rags to riches, so to speak, is starting from nothing and making something happen. Before we sign off, you know, how can people connect with you, with your brand? Let's throw out some social handles so they can connect with you. Yeah, absolutely. So personally, you can connect with me by first and last name. So alexisshomer.com. Uh, on socials, it's uh, at Shomer Alexis on pretty much everything. And Shomer is S-C-H-O-M-E-R. Um, businesses, you can connect with my marketing agency at Simply, simply dash branded .com or for socials, it's at simply branded LA. And the last one is my startup company. Uh, it's called XB Health, and it's actually a platform that helps people track physical therapy at home, pre and post surgery exercises, connect with your doctor, telehealth, all that kind of stuff. So, xbhealth.com and at XB Health on all socials. Awesome, Alexis. I want to thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation.